Hello, welcome back to Book Nerd TV. Today I'm going to talk about four books that I've read in the last two years or so that discuss climate either directly, how climate change is occurring, that it is occurring, and how it's going to impact the life of the people on the planet, or simply because of the nature of the book shows you through vivid description sometimes, just how much the planet has changed over the last hundred years. And you may ask yourself, why might this be interesting? It might not be, honestly, it might not be, but I found it interesting. And this really started for me when I had to read, I think it's two books for the 2020 Book Two Prize. And the two books that I had to read in, in my group, in my section, were Labyrinth of Ice by Buddy Levy and the Uninhabitable Planet by David Wallace Wells. Very briefly, Labyrinth of Ice is about a rescue mission that took place in the early 1900s for this army supported research expedition to Greenland. The research party was set to explore and conduct research in Greenland in the northernmost point reached at that point or pretty much at that point and they were only supposed to stay for like spring summer maybe moving into fall ish unfortunately the ship that was sent to pick them up and bring them back home sank on the way to pick up the research party of course because of the encroaching ice as a result the research party was stranded over winter in Greenland. Being stranded over winter in Greenland at that time was pretty tantamount to a death sentence. The temperatures were ridiculously cold. There was ice everywhere all the time. And you get that sense of ice, that sense of freezing, freezing temperatures not for a day, not for a week, but for months on end. And let's be clear, so they're so close to the North Pole that at, I forget whatever point in the year, that they cease to see the sun. The sun doesn't rise very high in the sky and it sets right back down. They had to deal with the lack of sunlight, the ridiculously freezing temperatures, and the fact that they soon realized their ship was not going to come and pick them up. And so what transpires from that point is the struggle of this maybe 12 or 14 person party to survive on the ice in Greenland over winter. It was a really, really, really well written book. Spoiler alert, not everyone in the party survives, but people do survive and they are eventually rescued. And I was going to say, and of course they were because someone lived to tell the tale of what happened while those men were wintering in Greenland, but they kept copious notes. They were a research party. They were a scientific research party. So not only were they mapping and trying to reach like the furthest most point that you can reach on Greenland. They were also watching the skies. They were taking the temperatures. It was just really, it was really fascinating. The, the extremes these researchers would go to gather scientific information. I thought it was a wonderful book. And if you are even remotely interested in Greenland, in ice, in how the climate was in the early 1900s, then this is a really good book to read because it just, it, there are points where in their struggle to survive, the party is traveling from their research station trying to go further south. They're doing this over land, but they're hauling canoes such as they were with them because at some point they're hoping to hit open water but they instead end up traveling the majority of the way over ice because they can't get to open water because everything is so frozen. There's a passage where the um, the leader of the expedition, and forgive me because I, I didn't look up everybody's name to, to recall this, but the leader of the expedition talks about how as they're trying to make their way from land to open water, that they're just crossing 
iceberg after iceberg and that, that he can hear the grinding and the smashing and the, the subduction of, of different icebergs. It was just, it was a wonderful book. And so I highly recommend that you read this book to give yourself an idea of what Greenland was like in the early 1900s. The next book that I read for, and so I just realized I read Underland as well as a part of my Book Two Prize in 2020. So I guess I came across all of these books as a result of the Book Two Prize. And I guess that's a good thing. That's one of the reasons why if you don't participate in the Book Two Prize, you should, because you're gonna read books that you would maybe never pick up in an attempt to participate in the prize. So as I was saying, the next book that I read was Underland by Robert McFarland. I absolutely loved the first third to half-ish of this book. It was just written so wonderfully well and it was so engrossing. And true to the title, a lot of the author's exploration takes place underground. For the one part that we are pretty much not underground is when he goes to Greenland and um, he explores a glacier with sort of this sort of climate activist researcher person. And it is not as lyrical as the beginning of the book, because as I said, the first third of the book was just so beautifully written. Um, the last half to last third wasn't as lyrical for me, but was still interesting. And especially the portion where he goes to Greenland, you know, and explores the, um, the glaciers and, and, and is with like a group of people who are also conducting research on the glaciers. And part of that is, is just to, to track and to measure the amount of melt, uh, to track maybe how, how large the glaciers are. Because of course, living in Greenland, they are aware of how much, just even in their lifetime, the glaciers and the icebergs and the ice, the permafrost has retreated from where it used to, where it used to be. The Inuit people who are maybe briefly mentioned in, in Underland, um, one of the men talks about how he's not able to do some of the things that he used to do because the ice is no longer firm or hard or there, right? So some of the hunting and the fishing and just the travel that he was able to participate in when he was younger, he can't do now because the ice has retreated so far and the land is no longer, it's no longer that permafrost. So it's just uh, an interesting read for me having the book previous, I believe, having just read about the icebound frozen over harbors and and bays and sea in labyrinth of ice to now come to today and to know that the 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 glaciers and the icebergs that those men saw and traveled across are for the most part gone. It's just, it's just, it's mind boggling and staggering. And so that's why I think reading Underland is a great compliment to reading Labyrinth of Ice because you get what Greenland was like a hundred years ago or so. And then you get what Greenland is like now and these stark, stark differences that are apparent because the globe, our climate is warming up. The third book that I read for the Book Two Prize in 2020 regarding climate specifically was um, The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. I did not connect with this book, um, did not enjoy reading it. That does not, however, mean that you might not enjoy the book. And some of the information contained within the book you might find interesting because it is sort of this very long sort of treatise on what happens to the earth as the planet warms by like three degrees, uh, five degrees, 10 degrees. It seemed like there was just sort of three different temperatures and sort of what is forecasted for the people living on the planet having to deal with life at this temperature, life at this temperature, life at this last temperature. Of course, clearly the last temperature, the 10 degree or so rise is really not a place we want to be continued rise in the temperature is not something that humans are going to want to endure and countries are not 
going to be at this point are not maybe, I say countries, but I guess I should really say governments are not, for the most part, are not really facing just how dire the situation will be because coastlines will change. There will be internal migrations. There will be issues with proper growing seasons and crops and hunger and just, so the book just kind of details sort of life at this level of disaster, life at this level of disaster, life at this level of disaster. And um, I guess it wasn't a pleasant read because it was a very um, sort of dire, it's a dire warning about what could happen if we, if we do nothing, if we continue on the track that we're on. It is my hope, it is my desperate hope that that more people will just understand that this is something that's really happening and that if there's anything that we as individual human beings can do to help mitigate the warming, if there's anything that we can do as a state, as a country, as a, as a hemisphere, the entire globe, I think I would hope that we would take those steps sooner rather than later because later really could be too late. And the last book that I read or listened to in this case, because it is an audible book, is Ice at the End of the World by John Gertner. This book is about Greenland. <laughs> and so can you see the ties, the things that kind of binding this together? It is basically a history of the exploration of Greenland, by sort of European and, and the West, how they went to Greenland to sort of explore the ice and the lands there. But then there's this transition from, I was gonna say mere exploration, but at the time, Greenland was like the undiscovered country. And which is what, what pulled so many explorers and eventually scientists to Greenland. But there is this transition late 1800s, early 1900s, where it's less about literal exploration of the country and of course the Arctic region. There's this shift to a more scientific, well actually around 1940s-ish, it was more about military and strategic placement than it was about science or exploration because, you know, World War. But after that time after World War II, the shift does start to happen where it's less about, you know, a staging area for bombs and planes and whatever else, the machines of war, right? But there is this really big shift from, from military bases to scientific exploration to, wait a minute, you know, notice how this ice is retreating so fast and what's happening and, you know, then there's the climate science all of this taking place in Greenland. I feel that if you read any of these books, any two of these books, either Labyrinth of Ice or Ice at the End of the World to give you sort of the, the history of what the ice was in the early 1900s. And then if you pick up Underland, you will see um, how the ice is now. Am I on a climate soapbox? I mean, maybe, I don't know. I don't feel like I am. I feel like, um, I feel like it's just, you can, from from the fires out west to the, how rainy it was this summer here in the south, it's just the climate is changing. That is a real thing. And, and if we as humans are, are doing things to speed that up, then I think I'm more than happy to do my part to help to help mitigate. And and so that's why I thought I'd come here and ramble on about it to you all. <laughs> if you have any thoughts about the changing climate sort of in your area where you live um, and you feel so moved to comment about it, you can do so down in the comments below. If you like this video, don't forget to leave me a like. If you are already a subscriber to the channel, thank you so much, Book Nerd Veteran. I really appreciate you. If this is the first video you've seen by me, go ahead and watch some of the other videos on the channel. And if you like what you see, go ahead and subscribe and become a Book Nerd Veteran. Thank you all so much for watching. And remember to stay safe, be good, do good, and I will see you in the next video.